our last, uh, of course, not least, uh, Linda, uh, I think maybe an excellent, um, excellent uh, last theme of this uh, very successful uh, uh, symposium. Uh, Linda uh, from uh, Waterloo, Waterloo University in Canada, uh, definitely one of the leaders in the field. It's nice to see how uh, she entered uh, into new um, areas, lithium sulfur, lithium oxygen, and whatever she touched, she became, she, she put herself in the, in the frontier. Also, it's a good opportunity to uh, congratulate Linda. Just a few weeks ago, she uh, awarded the prestigious MRC medal, uh, which uh, is very uh, competitive. Uh, so it's a good opportunity to uh, greet you again, Linda, for your achievements. And uh, I think that uh, we can move uh, now uh, to you and uh, 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 the screen is yours now. Thank you, Doran, for that very kind and also generous introduction. And um, thank you for the opportunity to um, speak at this really interesting symposium. I heard some really great talks, and as Peter pointed out, it's too bad that we can't meet in person, but hopefully we will soon. So um, let me share my screen. And hopefully you can see my slides. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, there's some, been some really nice talks on solid state batteries, obviously the one just um, presented by Peter on the lithium anode, um, of course, from Shirley Meng yesterday on some really important systems. And um, today I'm going to do a deep dive into mostly some solid state electrolytes. And I know this is the last talk of the symposium and it's running on to 5.30 in Israel, so you're probably all a little tired, so I apologize for some of the detail, but hopefully this might be sort of some, you know, some fun stuff as well. So I don't think I need to remind you that solid state batteries rely on superionic conductors. I think that um, Peter gave a nice introduction with that with the aguridite. And I don't need to probably remind you that there's an issue of the interface also, not just at the anode, but also at the cathode, where of course one has a triple phase boundary and one has to simultaneously transport electrons and lithium to the, to the cathode material. And so while we don't have a problem of the reactivity of liquid electrolyte, we do have um, this simultaneous electron and ion transport at the interface. Being Linda, being... Yes? Can you please switch to the monoslide mode? Yes. Um, how's that? Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry, yeah, I didn't. Um, I gave, just gave a talk in India a few hours ago, and <laughs> for some reason I had to use the other mode, so I was a bit confused there. So um, obviously having large secondary particle aggreg aggregates um, in the cathode is a major challenge, and, but whatever, we still have to control those interfaces. So a lot of the, these electrolytes have a lack of chemical stability with the positive electrode, um, which is actually some, somewhat even more problematic than at the negative electrode. And um, this uh, means that for most materials, especially for sulfides, they will require a protective coating on the surface of the cathode material to establish some stability. And I'll be talking about that a little bit with halides. And of course, as um, Peter so nicely pointed out, we, we need uh, lithium metal and that stability of the solid electrolyte is mostly kinetic in origin because you typically have passivating interface of some sort will be, will be formed. So um, it also raises the issue of probably putting any um, artificial layer in between the sodium or the lithium metal and the electrolyte uh, for many of these systems. So in the case of a uridite, this passivating layer effectively self-forms, but for a lot of other materials, that's not the case. And as I said, something artificial is required. So um, of course, many, there's been a lot of work done on oxide materials, uh, such as garnets, brobskites, uh, nasacon for sodium systems. And while they have good oxidation stability and good thermal stability, um, they do lack uh, ductility. So their Young's modulus is really very high. And that causes quite a few um, problems when one is trying to actually process the material. So the sulfides have sort of taken over, um, I mean, to a large extent, mostly because of their ductility uh, as a result of a fairly low Young's modulus and the order of um, 18 to 25 picopascals. 
And of course, they lack, however, oxidation stability um, and to a certain extent, some thermal stability. So I will be talking later about halides, which are kind of a compromise of sorts. Um, in a fairly ductile, they are usually fairly ductile materials with a Young's modulus similar to that of the um, phosphosulfides, but they have better oxidation stability. Of course, they uh, lack moisture stability. So all of these materials effectively have um, some detriment. And um, so I'm just going to be talking about three vignettes today, um, ways that we can try to establish high ionic conductivities. Certainly more than one millisiemens per centimeter is necessary, especially at the positive electrode, as Peter just mentioned. And uh, with neg negligible electronic conductivity, how do we actually find descriptors to establish facile conduction pathways? This to a certain extent relies on polarizable anion lattices. And I'll be talking a little bit just about the role of anion dynamics, how to establish a disorder in this mobile lattice um, to establish a weak interaction with the framework. And um, as I said, touching then finally on the cathode interface at the, at the end. Remind everyone of the formula for ionic conductivity and the fact that we need to um, minimize the activation energy for transport as well as maximizing the number of, of, of carriers. And I'll be talking a little bit about some of our neutron diffraction, which has been critical to understand the lithium ion sub lattice structure. I'm hiding from the sun here, so I'm squinting. So the first thing I'll be talking about um, is the role of anion dynamics uh, on fast ion conductors and a little bit about ab initio molecular dynamic work that we've done and neutron coupled with neutron diffraction studies. And in here, in this work, we're addressing what used to be called or still is called to a certain extent the paddle wheel effect, uh, which is really just can the, the dynamics of the anion actually affect the transport of the cation? So we're doing a deep dive here. And apologies for that if, if it's too late in the day. <laughs> so the paddle wheel, or sometimes called the revolving door mechanism, uh, was actually proposed long ago. And it was discovered um, in sulfates and phosphates, where the rotation of these tetrahedral moieties in the high temperature rotor phases um, was investigated. And this was investigated both in alpha lithium sulfate and in sodium phosphate. And it was debated by Martin Jensen in particular as to whether this was really a truly a paddle wheel mechanism, whether the anion dynamics were facilitating the transport of the cation or whether was, this was just a percolation effect and volume effects were also implicated. Um, and then later some quasi-elastic neutron scattering studies confirmed the rotational motion of these phosphate groups at around 600 degrees Kelvin, but it really wasn't established um, that the, the fact that the, how the anion rotation was coupled to cation rotation was not really established at this time. It was kind of hinted at uh, more than anything else. And then more recently, people have looked at other polyanions and brought that temperature down to sort of more intermediate values, 400 K. Uh, this is in these um, closo borate systems, for example, and also in this um, borohydride antiperovskite structure. So this is where um, our studies started. And I'll just give you a, a brief reminder of some of the phases of lithium Li3 PS4. So there's a gamma phase at room temperature, which is effectively not at all ion conductive. And the beta LS, well, I'm just going to call this LPS because it's easier to say. So the beta phase um, is stable at around 300 degrees. So gamma converts to beta at this temperature. And you can see that there's a dramatic increase in the volume. Volume is plotted here on the y-axis. And finally, there's an alpha phase at even higher temperature, uh, which is here. And we discovered that we could stabilize a higher volume phase um, by in inducing by in, in su substituting some of the phosphorus for silicon, which of course also stuffs the lattice up with some lithium. And so this is what we call the silicon Li LPS phase. So the um, important here factor then is, is, is the role of the paddle wheel or the anion rotation. And this just um, also shows the structure of the silicon substituted or the silicon LPS compared to the beta phase. So this material is a fairly good conductor, but one millisiemens at 200, just as it, or that's right, that should say 300, um, when it turns, when, when that phase is stable. But this material is actually stable at room temperature with about the same conductivity, about one millisiemens. And 
the introduction of the extra lithium in the structure basically splits the lithium sites, which are in the beta L3PS structure, into two sites each and changes the nature of the pathway for migration. And so that's one factor that leads to this high conductivity that's stabilized at room temperature. And that just shows the split sites and um, effectively increases, or it's equivalent to increasing the atomic displacement parameter. But um, while this is an entropically stabilized material, and this is shown from some phonon calculations that we've done, the more interesting factor um, is the um, issue of this paddle wheel um, mechanism. So we've looked at this by using the maximum entropy method. This extracts the information from the diffraction data without any assumptions. So effectively, we get the structure factors from our rebuild refinement, we apply the MEM algorithm, and we then find or we obtain nuclear densities directly. And um, so what you're looking at here then is a plot, a MEM plot from the neutron diffraction data of the nuclear density. So you can see in the gamma phase, this is it recorded at 200, you can see that there is absolutely no rotation, no motion whatsoever of this PS4 group. It's just uh, literally sitting there. And this is the material that has extremely low conductivity. Whereas the beta LPS in the high temperature phase at 200 degrees shows um, this, uh, the one that, that has a one millisiemen per centimeter conductivity, you can see quite clearly, whoops, right? You can see quite clearly that the um, density is smeared out between the sulfur groups and the PS4 group. And so this is basically indicative of very rapid reorientation of those PS4 groups. Whereas in the case of the non-conductive material, those groups are completely static. In other words, there are no, there are no anion dynamics. In contrast, in the silicon substituted material at 30 degrees or almost at room temperature, again, you can see this um, very smeared out density from, from the PS4 groups, which is almost comparable to that of the beta phase at 350 degrees. So the stabilization with the incorporation of silicon in the phosphorus and the incorporation of the extra lithium, um, certainly, as I said, it's, um, it's an entropically stabilized material, but more importantly, we see the same anion rotation of the PS4 groups at room temperature here as we do in the case of the high temperature phase at um, between, well, 350 centigrade. So this implies the importance of this rotation. And so we carried out um, AMID calculations to understand this a little bit better. And this just shows a one picosecond snapshot, a one picosecond snapshot where you can see the, the motion of all of the sulfide in turquoise, um, orange, uh, green, and magenta. So these sulfide groups are rapidly moving in this one picosecond time, time snapshot. And they move in concert with the lithium in this lattice and the lithium is hopping through a tetrahedral and octahedral site. And you can see that the, the PS4 group, or whether it's silicon substitute or not, the tetrahedral moiety shares an edge with this cage transport of the lithium as it moves through this tetrahedral to octahedral site. And so what that really, what that really implies in the structure Linda? Linda, we cannot hear you. Linda, we can't hear you. Linda, do you hear us? Confirms that we have um, a coupling of those motions. And that's further confirmed by the two-dimensional probability distribution of this phosphorus silicon lithium angle and the distance between the ligands and the atoms in the first Linda, shell. Linda, we lost your audio. Yeah, I'm sorry, I seem to have Hang on a second. Now it's fine. Now it's fine? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what that happened. Um, so you can hear me okay? No. Yep. Yeah. Okay, just let me know if, it, if it, I have an earphone and it seems to have cut out for some reason. So if this was, um, if there was no coupling of the 
lithium motion with that of the rotation of the tetrahedral moiety, you would just simply see a single delocalized spot where you can see this is actually quite highly delocalized. And again, that's confirmation of the strong correlation between the rotation of the anion and the transport of the lithium cation. And that coupling is, as I said, this physical coupling of the, of the tetrahedra with the edge of, of the polyhedra uh, that, that are, form the solvation cage for the lithium. We see the same effects in this um, sodium conductor. And this is a material which uh, has a similar formula to the famous LGPS iso material, but it's not isostructural. It has octahedral cages of sodium NaS6 uh, that span along the C axis and also along the A and the B axis. So this shows a view of that AD plane. And in all of the planes, we have octahedral sodium um, we have sodium in an octahedral site, and effectively the transport occurs through these triangular windows that span either side of the octahedron. And there is a full occupation and partial occupation strictly obeyed in all three directions um, in the crystal. Yes. And um, yes. we have, yes, I'm sorry, can you hear me? So we have. Um, isotropic diffusion along A, B, and C axis, and we have diffusion coefficients that are actually very similar to that of the um, lithium germanium phosphosulfide, which was reported long ago by Cano's group. So we have a very similar process here where we can see that at three degrees Kelvin, we effectively just have a static um, disorder of these PS4 groups, whereas at room temperature at 300 K, uh, we can see this very rapid rotation onset of the PS4 groups. And you can see this even more effectively at 450K, where we have, uh, there is effectively complete facile rotation. And this is, again, looking at these MEM maps that I was explaining from before. And the dotted lines just show this rotational disorder, or rotational motion, so to speak, of the PS4 groups. I'll skip through this slide. This is just the animation for the point. And so we then compared this of phosphosulfide with that of the antimony analog. And the antimony analog actually has a higher cell volume, so we expected better conductivity. But in fact, the conductivity is about a half that of the phosphorus analog. And the activation energy is significantly higher than the phosphorus analog. So this was a bit of a puzzle. And you can see that um, our AMID simulations show this higher activation energy as well for the antimony versus the phosphorus, either the sulfur or selenium analogs. And indeed, the MEM map show that there's almost no rotation at all for the SBS4 at 300K. You can see, only again, just a static disorder, just a bare onset of it for, at 450. Whereas again, as I just showed you for the phosphorus analog, there's really very facile rotation at 300. So, it isn't as if, it's not that the rotation of the PS4 groups is the only thing that leads to the conductivity, because obviously we still have conductivity in the antimony analog. It's just that it really does enhance that conductivity. And so, um, again, this is similar to the lithium case that I showed. You can see that the movement of the sodium is coupled with that rotation of the sulfur group within the polyanion um, motif. And this just is the comparable as I said, picture from the MEN map. So as the anion rotates, the AMID simulations show that the sodium ion transports within that one picosecond um, pathway. And again, when we put an artificial constraint, this happens to be along the A axis, but it would be true for any of the axes. When we have a constraint, the activation energy now is comparable to that of the antimony system, whereas when we free the rotation, the activation energy drops to 0.2 EV, which is actually very similar to what we measure um, experimentally for that material. So this is a, a somewhat artificial constraint, but it, it's, in, again, indicative of the role that the anions have to play in the rotation. And once again, it, because we have this PS4 <clears throat> group sharing an edge with the octahedral groups, we have a window opening up to about, in this case, again, 10 to 11 angstroms. And that is the case for the phosphorus analog where we see the rotation, but in the case of the antimony where there is no rotation, the window is, is much um, diminished. And again, this is reflected in the difference in the activation energies and in the conductivity. So in short, 
this rotation of the polyhedral units in these materials at room temperature, we believe effectively flattens the energy landscape that the cation needs to transport through because it opens the window for that transport and um, uh, effectively lowers the activation energy. Uh, some of this work has been published in, in JAX and the lithium work was published um, in Matter just um, a short while ago. So I'll end off then just talking a little bit about cooperative migration and flattening the energy landscape. Um, Peter talked about the agurodite material, which um, its structure is shown here. So it contains also phosphorus tetrahedra and these Frank Casper polyhedra of lithium cations, uh, which encompass sort of a complicated structure. This is a diagram from Wolfgang Zier's um, paper. And so there is um, what is called a doublet jump transport within these polyhedral units between two different sites in the lattice with an intermediate site in between. There are jumps within the cage, but the main jump is the intercage jump, which um, is between these two polyhedra. And this is thought to be the limiting uh, transport um, system in, in, the, in other words, if you can facilitate this jump, you increase the diffusivity, you increase the transport. And so there is um, a, a site here, which is called the 4A site, and it's either occupied by sulfur or by the halide um, in this agurodite structure. And in fact, they're disordered on both this 4A and this 4C site. So they're both occupied by sulfur and, and the halide. In the case of the iodide, there is, it is completely ordered. Whereas in the case of the chloride and bromine, which are the conductive materials, we have complete disorder between these sites for the sulfur and the chlorine. So we were able to form a disordered uh, or a highly conductive iodide, which is probably the first, I think, um, that was ever reported. And this just shows how the activation energy drops as we increase the silicon content in this antimony iodide. So the um, starting phase, which has almost no silicon and obviously no additional lithium, is very poorly conductive and that conductivity increases dramatically as we increase both silicon and lithium concentration in this material. And this is not a consequence of any anion disorder. So this is the anion disorder, the, the occupation between the 4A and the 4C sites measured both by single crystal and powder neutron diffraction. And even when we have a very low degree of disorder, we still have a very high conductivity of that material. And so measurements for annealed pellets are around between um, 12 and 15, depending on the silicon content, and even higher for sintered pellets. So these are truly super ionic materials. And while we have not established whether paddle wheel plays a role in this material, we have established that the certainly part of the reason for the onset of this increased for the high superionic conductivity is that we actually have a new site in the lattice, which we determined by powder neutron diffraction. And so there's actually two new sites. Um, one of them is um, what we call a 4D, and the other one is this new 48H site. And the important point here is that the, the most critical site um, is between these cages that I was describing. So there is effectively an intermediate site created by stuffing the lattice full of lithium, and that lowers the activation energy for hopping between those, those two lithium cages. And so because that is the um, rate limiting step, so to speak, for transport, by inducing a lower energy site, I mean a high energy site in this metastable interstitial site, we then facilitate the transport between the cages. So um, a lot of the concepts of stuffing lithium into a structure and populating these high energy interstitial sites was established by Ife e. Mo's nice paper in Nitric Communications in 2017. And effectively these interstitial sites are increasing the columbic repulsion between the sites and thus lowering the activation energy, again, flattening the landscape. So this is an example of stuffing lithium into a site to decrease this activation energy. And as I said, we don't, we have not yet established whether paddle wheel is also an important mechanism in this material um, or not. So then the last um, few minutes, I'll just talk about um, the cathode interface. So this shows the um, psychic voltammetry for um, a typical L LPS material. It's, it's very similar actually for a uridite. So what you see is that it's relatively low voltages around 2.7, you start to get oxidation of the sulfide 
at that cathode interface and you effectively form sulfur. And that forms an insulating barrier. And so it's required that one um, passivate or actually coat the NCM type materials. And typically one uses something like a lithium niobate coating um, to inhibit that reactivity. In other words, to inhibit the oxidation of the, of the sulfur, whether it be LA, LPS or a uridite. So we started looking at halide materials um, that will enable coating-free cathodes to be used. And the first of these was um, a yttrium zirconium chloride. And I'll be talking about a little, just very briefly about that today. So the concept here is that rather than having to protect the cathode material, as I said, with a lithium niobate coating, which is rather difficult to apply in a, um, in a very reliable and uniform fashion, if you can then eliminate this coating and simply use a halide that has a high oxidation potential. Um, so for example, in the case of this yttrium zirconium chloride, the onset of oxidation is at around 4.3 um, volts. And this is in accord with the predicted potentials, the redox potentials for both chlorine and, and bromine. So uh, these materials, these halides, as I mentioned at the very start of the talk, are mechanically soft and uh, fairly ductile, similar to the sulfides. And then the question is really, as I said, how to increase their ionic conductivity or how to get it into a realm which is useful. So um, this, we're not the only ones to be doing this. So, um, first of all, Asano's um, group uh, reported the lithium bromide. These had conductivities about the order of seven times 10 to the minus four. Um, Yang Shouhorn reported on a, an erbium chloride, again, about 10 to the minus four. Um, Siemens per centimeter. And Andy Sun reported uh, recently on a lithium indium chloride, which was now in the milli Siemens region, about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3. And um, there's also, uh, so then our work then was reported in ACS Energy Letters on this um, either erbium or yttrium zirconium chloride. So I'll be talking about that just briefly. And so you go from a from the non-zirconium substituted material to the zirconium substituted material through a series of different phases. And phases two and three are the so-called superionic phase with this 1.4 millisiemen per centimeter um, conductivity. We thought at the time that this was the first millisiemen class chloride, but Andy Sun's paper sort of came out around the same time. So the point is that we have a completely different structure in this highly conductive phase, and we have new lithium pathways for migration, which are shown here. This is direct based on neutron diffraction data. So in the, um, in the parent phase, which is relatively poorly conductive, um, we simply have a high energy pathway moving between two lithium sites in the structure. Whereas in this new phase, we now have a new pathway, which is from a bond valence energy site model. And so this is a lower energy pathway that's sketched out here in the red dot. And this lowers the activation energy for transport, you know, not as much as we would like, but certainly more than in the parent phase and enough to give us this um, one and a half millisiemen per centimeter conductivity. And um, so we've made cells from these materials with a completely bare cathode. We started off with just using lithium cobalt oxide as our cathode material and established fairly good cycling properties for these materials, um, up to around 200 cycles with good Coulombic efficiency. And more recently, we've in, uh, developed a, a thiospinel. So this is the first halide spinel ion conductor. Again, similar conductivity, um, pretty good activation, low activation energy. And the structure of this spinel is shown here. So it's a lithium scandium spinel in which the lithium uh, sublattice is completely disordered. And that is, again, what gives rise to this high conductivity. And we've married this material either with um, a fairly high nickel material or NMC622. And this shows the data for the 622 material. So we, we see a little fading capacity over 70 cycles. It's, we're still in the early stages of this. Um, but the point is that we can cycle these materials all the way up to 4.6 volts without any cathode coating whatsoever. So this is a completely uh, naked NMC material and still achieves good stability. So in conclusion, I think I'm run out of time. Um, we've established some new descriptors for, ultra, for superionic conductivity. We were able to get to very superionic conductivities that exceed 10 millisiemens. And this is what's necessary to sustain thick electrodes and high capacity cells, especially in cathode composites. 
and hopefully I've shown you briefly at least that halides enable bare high voltage active materials. Clearly these do not quite have the conductivity that we're aiming for for cathode composite material for cathode composites. So there's a lot of work to be done to increase um, to apply the principles that we know to increase that conductivity. And hopefully at least the take home messages are that increasing vacancy population and increasing the halide content in aguridite and in other materials are important strategies to increase the conductivity. You can actually increase the cation disorder, populate intermediate energy sites, and this changes the energy landscape. Anion dynamics can effectively lower that activation energy by about a factor of two. And I think we've proven that the anion rotation is, is, is indeed coupled to lithium ion transport. Um, and so trying to find cost-effective versions of lithium metal halides is really uh, next on our agenda to push that one millisiemen into the 10 millisiemen regime. So with that, I would like to thank BASF for their generous funding over the last decade for a lot of the electrolyte work. Uh, we're now also working with the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research to understand some of the fundamentals of ion transport, especially like to thank my group for all of their hard work and uh, for these folks for helping with our neutron diffraction experiments. And I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Linda, for this uh, very nice talk, uh, high level, detailed. Uh, it's always amazing to see how we can enter into fine details uh, so rigorously. Um, I'm, I'm always inspired, I'm always inspired. So we can have some discussion. First of all, I see some uh, accumulation of uh, questions. I may also come with a, 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 a comment of a devil advocate, but let's see. First of all, um, I see there is a, a, a from Rene uh, Winnick. Is it, you can see it also, you have the screen, you can see it, but I, I can read. Uh, uh, is, it, is it correct that the high Silicon concentration in a silicon LPS transforms into LGPS-like phase? This is the first question. So the answer is uh, no. The high silicon concentration of that phase, um, so it, the structure is, is really beta LPS. So we, we go from um, beta LPS, which is only stable at high temperature, to a room temperature stabilized form, but it's not an LGPS-like phase. Dawn, perhaps I could ask a question. Linda, Certainly what down. temperature were your solid state cells run at? Were, were they elevated temperature or room temperature? They were room temperature. Okay, great results then. Now, uh, a next question. Might the paddle wheel uh, mechanism be also active in the LGPS-like uh, structures? Well, um, we're, we're trying to, the question, the answer is we have not seen any evidence for paddle wheel in LGPS per se. We have looked and it, it is not active. And one of the big questions is what does turn on the paddle wheel effect in some of these materials, but obviously not in others. And we honestly don't understand that. It's probably related to a volume effect of the lattice, but it may be more subtle. So I can only answer that no, it's not active in LGPS, but it is active in that sodium analog, which is a completely different structure than LGPS. Linda, I have a question. Very good talk, very nice achievements. Do you have number for the columbic efficiency of the superconductors, ionic conductors? Uh, well, we have, a, we have a, a value for the, I mean, the coulombic efficiency of the cells is very close to 100%. How, how close? Do you have a number? Uh, typically, we're looking at about, it varies from material to material, but it's upwards of 99.5% for some materials in that ballpark. Some of them are 99.8. It, it depends on the, on the electrolyte that we're looking at. Thank you. Now, there is a, a, another question, Linda. Uh, most likely, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, most likely the associated electrolyte have a polycrystalline nanomicromorphology with, a, with an amorphous-like atomic structure between the crystallites. So now, uh, the, how is the um, uh, ion connectivity in the amorphous uh, regions or across, or across the uh, crystallite boundaries? So the, 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 the question is probably to address uh, possible uh, 
roots of ionic transport uh, in, in the green boundaries? Uh, what, what is the, what the exact mechanism of the, of the ion transport? This was the theme of the question. Mm. Um, that's a good question, and the answer is somewhat complicated. So, for example, in the case of the antimony agiridite material, we do see some exsolvation of silicon sulfide because the material is quasi, it's sort of quasi stable, metastable. And so if we try to push too much silicon and lithium into that material, we end up exsolving SIS4 in the grain boundaries and that really limits the conductivity. So as long as we minimize that exsolvation by tuning the silicon content, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, meaning that we probably have some limitation to grain boundary transport, but you know, not, not that much. So the point is that when we can see that when we center these materials at higher temperature, and that's impractical for a real cell, uh, the actual the conductivity clearly um, increases. So I mean, all the, the simple answer is yes, we do have materials in the grain boundary. Um, yes, that limits transport. The ionic conductivity we can't really, we, we, sometimes we do low temperature experiments because the materials are so superionic that we have to go to very low temperatures in order to really um, look at that grain boundary transport. And that's how we've been able to see that it's a, a problem for some of the systems, but it's not so much a problem for the standard agiridite, the ones that Peter was talking about, uh, that seem to have minimal contributions in that, in that grain boundary area. So I hope that answers the question, but I, it sound, I know I'm answering it a bit <laughs> I'm not answering it very clearly, but in other words, some of them are going to be very pure materials that probably don't have a lot of amorphous material in grain boundaries. Others, we have to work hard to make sure that there isn't um, a resistive grain boundary exculvated phase. Uh, Linda, this is Shirley. Can I yes, ask a couple questions? There is a question from the panelists. Uh, yeah, hi, Doron. Uh, thank you. Linda, like great talk as always. Uh, I think I try to link your talk a little bit with Peter's talk in, in terms of critical current density. Uh, and uh, in your cycling, I mean, I guess the, the room temperature cycling is done at a relatively low critical current density. Do you uh, foresee any issues with the, um, you know, uh, critical current density issues in the solid state battery? Oh, well, of course. Um, and as Peter pointed out, a lot of that may be due to the uh, lithium negative electrode. Um, so these cells, um, these cells are cycled at a point at C over five rate. And I'm trying to think of what that, what that actually translates into. So, I mean, the big answer to you, or the, the general answer is that we have, of course, we see problems with cycling cells at high current density. There's, that's, that's unquestionable. And we generally, um, because we're cycling at room temperature, we don't tend to exceed one milliamp per square centimeter, but we've gone as high as two, if Thank you're looking for a number. What pressure, Linda? Uh, what's the pressure? Um, we don't have a pressure transducer. We're sort of in the region of probably what Shirley was talking about in, in her talk yesterday, sort of in the kilopascal region. M megapascal, you mean? Sorry, yeah. megapascal, yes. <laughs> you got me excited there for a minute, but I, <laughs> I just my excitement level just went down. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're sort of in about 30 megapascals or so. Yeah. yeah, thank you both for sharing all the insights on solid state. It's extremely helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm.